Well, friends, good evening. Very warm welcome to everyone to our service. Tonight, our worship service, we're going to begin singing Psalm 126. This is Sing Psalms. It's page 171. And we can sing the psalm together, 126. When Zion's fortunes God restored, it was a dream come true. Our mouths were then with laughter filled, our tongues with songs anew. The nation said, the Lord has done great things for Israel. The Lord did mighty things for us, and joy our hearts knew well. Let's sing this psalm, 126. When Zion's fortunes God restored. Zion's fortunes God restored, it was a dream come true. Our mouths were then with laughter filled, our tongues with songs anew. The nation said the Lord has done great. Join together and let's seek God in prayer. Let's all pray. Lord our God, to have these words to sing to you and to share in the recounting of your great and miraculous dealings with your people in the Old Testament is a great joy for us. And it's so helpful to remember what you've done in the past of how you have unfolded through history and human experience your eternal purposes. It's only when we have your word to shed light on these things that they begin to make sense. We remember tonight how around the crucifixion all the religious people, most of them, who belong to Uh, the highest uh, religious court of the land, that they were all set against you, fulfilling Psalm 2, describing the rebellion of mankind and the rebellion of rulers and kings against you and against your authority and against your Christ. But it's only as eyes are opened that the significance of the cross makes sense. To the Jew, we're told in 1 Corinthians, the cross, the preaching of the cross is a stumbling block. It's something they trip up over. It's something that hinders and gets in the way of their understanding of being right before you. They think, and it's natural to us, Lord, to think before we're converted that we're good enough. And we're like the Pharisee who would say, maybe maybe say prayers and In prayers, all we would do is judge other people and condemn them for not being as good as us. But only when eyes are opened, we see and we realize in a very real sense what in a very specific and unique situation David felt when Nathan, your servant, spoke to him and said, you are the man. We thank you for that amazing power that is power indeed, but can be so somewhat imperceptible. Like with Elijah, it wasn't in 
the violence of nature, somewhat appearing to be untamed with a whirlwind or with a fire or the earthquake. But it's in the silence. There was that still small voice, we're told, of a thin silence, almost imperceptible. But Lord, how powerful it was. And it's there we, we look for you. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we're looking in the wrong place. And some people might be thinking as well that it's where certain things are happening. That that is where the Lord is working. And we thank you for all the evidence that we can see of where you are working in great ways. In, uh, among sometimes in some places among prisoners. And how your word and power and grace can be seen to spread in some places through the testimony of either one or two and in other parts of the world as well where the, the, it would seem like the, the government doors are shut to mission work, evangelism and gospel proclamation only for your word to be having free course and being glorified. No matter what people can do, you show us. And history proves the fact from your word and in our own histories that we can read of as well is that it is impossible to silence your voice. It's impossible. And it's what men and women and governments and tragically churches in some places are trying to do to close your word and throw it away and, and try to make out its under relevance that it has no place in modern society. Lord, you are speaking to us. You're speaking to us in providence. The events in life, the unfolding of history, is your voice to the sons of men and sons of, uh, the sons and the daughters of men. Not only to the sons and daughters of uh, the Old Testament saints and the New Testament people, but to ourselves in this century. And with the somewhat rapid unfolding of so many different events, we're hearing about so much. We can see so much. But, uh, Lord, we maybe don't realize or read the signs. You've told us that no one knows the day or the hour of your return. We thank you for that. But you've made it very clear to us, and even with rebuke, that we should know the signs of the times. And you have described how the ages will unfold and how things would be towards the end of the New Testament age. And how close it would seem, not that anyone dares to think the end is close, but how close it is now compared to when we first believed. And how much closer now to when the proclamation of the gospel was first announced. And we thank you, Lord, for that and the chaos and the distress and the devastation that can be seen throughout the world. Whether things happening we say the human error, accidents, the Pakistan train, and tens of people killed and many more injured. Whether it's happening with floods, rainstorms, heat waves, so many things that scientists are trying to pinpoint and making us the blame for, making us the cause for, and making us to feel the blame for it. Though the science itself may question so much of ideologies and how the green agenda. And Lord, we see the rising of human ideas. And you tell us through Paul's writing to Timothy, the day was coming when they would be forbidding to eat meat. And Lord, the farms in the Netherlands, different parts of where the influence of the EU still takes hold. And how farming is being Something that was given even in the Old Testament to cultivate the land and in the in, in sense of, of raising livestock and, and things. But all with a view to reducing all these emissions that you've told us from the beginning. That we should be expecting certain things to be taking place. Things that humans cannot control and in a sense haven't caused in one sense directly but through Adam we've caused it. That's what you reveal to us. That all that's happened in creation with the curse and the symbolism that the thorns and the thistles show us 
are indicative of the fact that this whole universe is under the divine curse. You said to Adam, cursed is the ground for your sake. But you also tell us through Romans 8, through Paul, that the whole creation is groaning together in labor pains. It's not just the earth. And the whole of creation, the whole of the universe has been somewhat and somehow we cannot understand how affected and tinged by the effects of sin and the curse. And when we sometimes are, like today, able to look out the window and from early hours to late hours and see the beauty of whether be out experiencing and enjoying it, to marvel at your creation and the therapy it can have, but to realize it's nothing like it was and certainly nothing like it will be yet. Where you say in the Revelation that the new creation and all that comes with it will be such that you say, Behold, I make all things new. We cannot understand it. And there's a sense that in and of itself that wouldn't be heaven for us. It's where you are. And though a creation may be glorified somewhat, maybe like in a way what we thought of earlier in how Moses was praying, that he didn't want, well, when you said to him that you would send the angel, your angel ahead of him and Israel to take them into the land, it's not the land Moses wanted. There's a sense, Lord, where we would even risk to say it meant nothing to him, absolutely nothing to him, and his mission didn't mean anything because... He said to you, if your presence does not go with me, do not carry us up from here. He would rather be stuck in the wilderness with the people all around him than to go on that journey with angelic presence and assistance, but with the presence of the Lord absent. It is for your presence and for the realities of your nearness we seek in this life but that will be so full in the one that is coming. Where we're told in the Revelation again that there's no need of the, te there's no temple there, no building like this, where we come aside and try to draw near to you in a special way. And like with the temple in Israel, you were pleased to reveal yourself in a special way, in a special location. But we're told there there's no temple because you, we're told, are the temple. And you are everywhere. And your presence not only fills all of space and time, but you are infinitely and eternally beyond both. You are, you say in the prophet, the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity and whose name is holy. For us, Lord, the wonder and the shock that such a God as you are is yet pleased to dwell with those who are humble and of sincere spirits and who tremble at your word. See, so have that attitude, Lord, where we realize you are not living in bondage, but living in liberty and freedom that belongs to the children of God. We we're told in, in uh, the writings of Paul, we're told, we're told in Romans 8 again, we have not received the spirit of bondage, but the spirit that cries, Abba, Father, where there is that awareness of intimacy and nearness and fellowship and communion that gives a confidence and a boldness that isn't natural to us to come into the presence of God and to be able to say, like Thomas did when he said, My Lord and my God, Praying for your blessing on the gathering tonight. Thank you, Lord, for everyone here and for all who are out in the morning, for all the families. So lovely to see so many and to be able to gather together. And it's not always possible. And we're thinking, praying for those who are at home, those who are in hospital tonight, those who've had such long stays and where there's a recurrence of illness at home as well, in, in, in different places where care is provided and needed. We thank you, Lord, for all who are able and you are qualified to provide that. Think of other places, other parts of the world, and how difficult it is, how different it is. And we have to give thanks to you, Lord, the one 
who gives what we have to help us in these areas of life and in these areas of great need. Be near to all who are weak, we pray. That weakness that illness brings, even having no appetite, will bring the weakness. But how the weakness of body through illness is completely different and how the body fights and how the exhaustion can come and the mind and the soul can go down sometimes. But we thank you, Lord, that in these times when we may sink or feel we're sinking, it's there that we can appreciate being taken again out of that darkness and into light and to know joy that is inexpressible, that is full of glory, and that's even able to confound people looking on. When we would ordinarily be in pain and distress, to have the peace of God that passes all understanding. We pray for mourning families, those, Lord, in, in shock throughout our communities. We pray that you would give strength and blessing and grace and give peace, bring salvation into homes and hearts and lives in the most difficult of circumstances where not only words fail but thoughts can fail. And where nothing but shock and silence can take place. We pray, Lord, that you would help and sustain all who are in, in need today. All who are struggling with, with grief and sorrow, recent or past. And how it can be so often a daily thing. Daily re reminders and triggers. And Lord, for help to, to be looking to you. And to be seeing you. And through all of the different situations that we may meet. Just like we thought of in the morning. How Jonah and the other disciples came to discover you. In a far greater way than they ever would have. If they'd kept going the way their lives were going. Lord as you're speaking to us tonight. We open your word and pray that you will speak to us personally. And that you will be present to guide us in everything we're doing and in our thinking. Not only here in trying to, in trying to read and share your word. But, but as we gather together under the word. That we would all of us be still. And that we would know that you are God. And that we wouldn't be able to duck or dive as it were or hide. But that we would with open arms as it were embrace your word. Through hearing your voice as you've brought us here tonight in your will. Remember us in mercy, we pray. We commit our way to you, giving thanks for your goodness and your guidance, giving thanks, Lord, for your patience and perseverance with us. We'd have given up on ourselves a long time ago, but your grace is so amazing. And it is the confidence we've got that where you have begun this good work, you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We confess our sins in your presence. Praying that you will hide your face from them. Those we're aware of. And those we're maybe not aware of. That we would Lord be blessed with that sense of forgiveness. And that liberty that sense of forgiveness brings. And when there's any sense of guilt and shame. We can find it hard to pray. Hard to praise. And hard to pray. We might feel that you're against us. But you never are. And if we ever wonder to think, Lord, of the darkness of the cross, the most horrific and intense of human experiences, human capability taken to its ultimate and its extreme. And even there, where your son said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was there, and we, we remind ourselves of what he said earlier to the disciples, Therefore, does my Father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again? And so whatever it may look like, and not that we can ever pry into it really, but the Father loved the Son. And that never changed. You always said that he is your beloved Son in whom you were well pleased. That how the darkness and what was unique in that Situation on the cross, what your people may find is like Isaiah describes them, those who walk in darkness 
and have no light. What are they to do? Well, you tell, you tell us through Isaiah that we are to, to trust in the name of the Lord and to stay upon our God. Not to try and understand or even find our way through it, but to stop and to trust in you. As you've said it, you will keep those people in perfect peace whose minds are stayed on you, whose minds are set upon you. Lord, help us. Our minds are so often everywhere else. And when we try and think of you, there's so much of a distraction that will come in. But you've given us your word to concentrate and read and focus, to gather our thoughts. And even now as we meet, come round your word, may it be the case that we're able to listen and to receive your word. We ask everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue singing uh, and sing Psalms and we turn to 67. Psalm 67. Find this on page 84 in the, the books. Psalm 67, prayer for God's blessing. God be merciful and bless us, shine upon us with your face, that the earth may know your actions and all lands your saving grace. O God, may the peoples praise you. May all people sing your praise, for you judge the nations justly, ruling over every race. Let's sing this psalm, Psalm 67. God be merciful and bless us. God be merciful and bless us. Shine upon us with your face that the earth may know your actions and all the New Testament, God's Word in Matthew 27, Matthew 27, and beginning at verse 45, Matthew 27, 45, we'll read it into chapter 28, to the end of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, and at verse 45, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which that is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. 
The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance, who had followed him from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that impostor said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has risen. As he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, this disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so on. May God bless her. Reading from his word. Let's turn to Psalm 100, the 100th Psalm. Scottish Psalter, and it's the first edition, page 362. Psalm 100. All people that on earth do dwell. Sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with mirth. His praise forth tell. Come ye before him and rejoice. Let's sing this psalm. Psalm 100. (laughs) All people that on earth do dwell. Sing. for 
Let's come again to the passage we read, Matthew 28, and we can reread verse 18, which is somewhat central to the accomplishment of our Lord's resurrection. Verse 18, Matthew 28, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So important to remember that, isn't it? At a time maybe where there's so much chaos and upheaval in so many different ways and so many different places, and even on a personal level to be reminded and to remember <coughs> that he, our Lord, has all authority. Uh, the translation you have might say power. Um, the word would have meant something different back then, but the word is actual authority. You can have all the power you want, but if you don't have authority, you can't use it. And what our Lord is saying, I think, is that he has been, as a result of his resurrection and as a result of his ascension, coronation, and as we're told, his session, or being seated at the right hand of God, that all of that happens in order to um, lead him to that place where he will have this power and all of this authority. It's the hope of the church. It's the hope of the Christian. And um, in fact, the very last sentence where it says, I am with you, <coughs> I am, excuse me, with you always, that word always is literally all the days, every single day, with all of the, what that means. And uh, it's been said by um, the, the predecessor of uh, Lloyd -Jones, Martin Lloyd-Jones in Westminster Chapel, G. Campbell Morgan. You can still access, if you're ever interested to it, a, a very, very worthwhile thing to read some of his materials, Campbell Morgan, and to see just the insight and the way these great men were able to expound the Bible the way they were. But the story's told, or he told the story himself, rather. Campbell Morgan did, that he was once speaking to, there was two Christian ladies, if I remember this right. What was said to him is what matters. But he said about these words, I am with you always. He said, what a promise. And he was rebuked for it. And he was told it isn't a promise, it's a statement of fact. And you might argue, well, what's the difference? A promise is something that in its very nature is somewhat future. You know, we're told in Romans 8, for what a person sees, why do they still hope for it? But if we hope for that which we do not see, then with patience we wait for it. And there is that sense, I think, where we've got to, we've got to bear that in mind. I am, not I will be, I am. And the language is so amazing in so many, in, in so many ways for so many reasons. <laughs> At times our Lord speaks in the, in, in the, of the future as though it was already present. When he meets Mary, Mary in the garden and John, he says, do not cling to me because I have not yet ascended. So there are stages. What's referred to as our Lord's exaltation is humiliation with his becoming man, being made in the likeness of sinful flesh and being condemned for sin in the flesh and with his sufferings and his burial, his death and his burial, they were steps of his humiliation, these downward steps. Philippians 2, in an unparalleled and unequal way, even though can we dare we say it in the Bible, because of its fullness, describes that condescension, that self-humbling, but doesn't finish there because the chapter there, Philippians 2, moves on to speak of our Lord's exaltation, that he has been given a name that is above every name. And the name just doesn't mean, we were hearing of that recently in uh, one of the, the sermons, the, the name of God is his revealed character, his attributes, his perfections. And when it's said that he has been, our Lord has been given the name and that, uh, that is above every name, it's a status, it's a position that the name of Jesus now reveals. History would have to take its course in order for that name and for that status and for that position to be conferred upon the Son Psalm 2 says, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And whatever we may think about that begetting, 
the New Testament, Acts explains that reference isn't to eternal generation at all. It is to resurrection. You want to search that one out. It's a fascinating. It's basically Romans 1 explains it. Declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. It was the declaration God made about his Son. When he raised him from the dead, he said, you are my son. He says to the world, this is my son. What we see it is baptism in the Mount of Transfiguration. Romans 1 explains to have taken place in fact and in declaration at, through, and by the resurrection of Christ. That makes us think, well, who raised him from the dead? It's a sense where, again, Romans 8, what a study in its own way, that he raised himself. You think in terms of the Bible, no man takes my life from me, John 10 I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. But we're told in Romans 8 of the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead. The spirit of the Father. The Holy Spirit. And yet if you would want to read it and search it out, what a rewarding thing it is to see that the Father is also described as raising the Son. The Son raising himself. The Father raising the Son by the Spirit. And the Father raising the Son himself. Not different things. And they're not mutually exclusive. They don't cancel each other out. It's looking at the same reality from different biblical perspectives. And the three things are there. And and, and other angles we can look at it from where the Bible teaches us. And it highlights, does it not, the fact that so much of this is impossible for us to really enter into. It's so difficult. But it's glorious. He has ascended. And from that position now we see him. He's in Revelation 5 described as ascending. Well, the ascension is is presupposed because John has a vision of heaven. And he sees the Father on the throne. He sees the angels. He sees the elders. He sees the the, the church united. And it's it's a specific point in time because he says he looked. And the Father has a scroll in his hand that no one's allowed to look on. Can't read the contents or loosen the seals or unfold the meaning. It's really the New Testament age, the rest of human history from the ascension of Christ until the end, the final end, where Revelation ends. And that scroll is something John sees no one can look at, no one can touch, and so he cries. John's weeping with a vision of heaven because he knows there's something very significant, that things are at a standstill. And the Father is seen as holding out the destiny of the universe, Every single detail you'll see in Revelation chapter 6 and following, the seals are opened on this book. It's a scroll. The children might think of the old-fashioned kind of scroll, and you could think of it being sealed or, 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 or held tight. You can you think of a modern-day equivalent where, where paper isn't, in, in one sense, as, as, as much of a thing in books and so on. But anyway, the scroll was sealed. No one could look at it. No one could loose the, the seals around it. And then all of a sudden... John is told not to weep. And then the the angel explains to him that there's someone standing who has prevailed, who has conquered, who has earned the right to do this. And what is that? He comes, our Lord is as the the, the lamb as, as though he had been slain. The picture of one who has been through the physical trauma of crucifixion, but who has risen and who is alive and who has now appeared in heaven. That had never happened before. What would you think about when you think, what do we think about heaven? What a a thing to say. But when we think about heaven, and you've maybe heard it, and this isn't to characterize anyone, there's a number of of Irish preachers of a, you can think of someone like Ian Paisley, the late Ian Paisley, and that group. They'd be like three Presbyterians of Ulster. This isn't everyone, but if you listen, you'll sometimes hear, you've maybe heard it before from others, and, and talking about when we leave this world, they say we enter into God's eternity. We don't. We actually don't. That's an impossibility. And to say we enter into eternity, what are we talking about? That we're entering a timeless zone where there's this kind of, that's where our mind has to go if we say that a vacuum of time. There's neither past, present, or future. That, however, completely clashes with our creaturehood. God has made us to exist in time and space. We cannot exist otherwise. Even with a resurrection body that will not be hindered by physical limitations. What a thought. 
will exist within space and time. Eternity is a divine characteristic. You mustn't think of it as, as a realm that we can analyze by itself. The only way we can think of eternity, if at all, is by thinking about God. He has always been there. No beginning, no end. Some people say that means there's no past, present, or future in God's awareness of the unfolding of history. So an error that goes around, that has been around for a while, is called open theism, like God learns. Like God doesn't know everything about you. And it's as you live and he gets to know you that he changes accordingly. And it's such a blasphemous thing to say, isn't it? But you think about the before and after in the experience of the Son of God. Are we very cautious even saying that? Because there's a sense we can, we're only, you know, you're coming to the edge of this massive ocean and you're just looking at it. The glory of God in the person of Christ. Who can begin to go anywhere near these realities? The scripture will guide us so far, but when it is guiding us, it tells us, and even think of the terminology. It's in Galatians, in the fullness of time. Think of that. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem those who were under the law so there was a time when God sent his son there's a time when the son came meaning there's a before and after and our view of God's eternity is almost of this you know we think of God knowing everything all at once we try and visualize that because for us we have to grow in knowledge and we increase in knowledge through experience and we, what we perceive through our physical senses and our brain processes. Unless, of course, it's the work of the Holy Spirit on a completely, a completely a, a other level where he involves our minds, he involves our, our personalities. But he is our Lord. He is there. And just as he, you know, we talk about leaving heaven. I don't know, is it, do, do, you, are you, are you less, do you split hairs less when you get older as a Christian? Or do you see things? Maybe it's not so much that. It's that you actually see things in a way you never saw it. How many times have you heard people say he left heaven? Theologically we'll say, well, that's an impossibility. It is, in one sense. But, you know, challenge yourself, and I'll challenge myself, as, as has had to be the case. And I think, well, maybe seeing things hopefully clearer now, it's that the Bible says he did. The Bible said he came. The Bible says the Son came. That says the Father sent the Son. And so whatever we might think about an eternal, infinite being moving from one place to another, which is an impossibility because he's everywhere all at once, all the time. It's where these concepts, we've got to, if they're getting in our way, we've got to not leave them, but leave them aside for a moment. Because he came Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul says, of whom he is the chief. But what a statement of fact. And what a blessing to be reminded as he was that the Lord is not saying he's going to be with you, but that he is with you. But we're trying to say the promise involves, his statement is involving, his teaching is involving uh, a future that is, or, or is actually declaring the fact about something that is actually to take place in the future. He's saying, I am with you. When he ascends to the Father, as in the upper room teaching, John 13 through to 16, maybe 17, he talks of his absence and the Spirit's presence. He could only be in one place at one time, physically. But he's saying, in effect, when he returns and ascends to heaven, the Father will send another comforter. He, interestingly, the Father and Son, are both described in different ways to send the Spirit. Not that this Holy Spirit is in any way inferior to Father and Son, but what is referred to as, well, it doesn't matter. The word is usually his, his, his economical, his way of working, God's way of working. The Father sends the Son. The Son and the Father send the Spirit. It's not that there's an inferiority or anything like that. But the Lord is saying that in the order of the plan of redemption, when he ascends, he will send the Holy Spirit. In fact, Acts 1, it's amazing, the day of Pentecost. And, and throughout Acts, the way the disciples understood what was taking place, 
And even the way Peter prays in the opening of Acts, where they're looking to replace Judas, and they cast lots. So it's a biblical thing to do when you have to, if you're trusting in God. Of course, that's unique, but you know, there's lots cast in different ways and different parts of Scripture and so on. But just thinking about that, they did that, but they prayed. Peter led them in prayer. And he said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all people. He's talking to Jesus. You read Acts 1, you'll see it's not the father Peter's talking to. And we'll leave it there. It's very interesting why, in many ways, Peter is having a conversation with the person he used to know, to have him physically present. But he's as real to Peter. He's as real to the church as though he was physically with them. Isn't that amazing? The Holy Spirit ministering the presence of Christ, bringing the power and the realities of Christ's teaching. He said that. He will not speak of himself. He will take what is mine and will show it to you. He says that, does he not? He will glorify me. Now, the children, when you think of it, how does that figure out? Well, someone once illustrated, and you maybe think of it, don't know, the winter nights are a while away, um, the lovely nights just now, but when you get the dark nights and sometimes the castle, the Lewis Castle, or even the War Memorial, or anywhere you think of the, the, we've got the own War Memorial just up the road, and when there's a light shining on it, it's not the light that you're seeing, but it's what it illuminates, isn't it? So when you're, if you're out or you're driving to, you know, Jesus said, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You are the light of the world. There's a radiance, but the radiance is on what the light is shining on. It's not the source that you think of so much, so much. We are to think of him, but where the Lord is present, where the Holy Spirit is moving, Christ will be central. And that's in, in our lives too. Colossians 1, he is described as being Christ in you, the hope of glory. The very reality of the personal presence of the Lord. I am with you always. The whole situation is surrounded, however, with, with so much that would lead us as observers and onlookers to think that this could never happen. This is why I think the Jews, by the Jews meaning the, the, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the council, where they'd meet and come up with all these demonic ideas and plans and schemes to have him crucified. And then once he's buried, they're not, not satisfied. They're saying, look, this imposter, they're saying, he said after three days he'll rise, so let's make sure it can't happen. The blindness, the ignorance, and that this isn't something that has happened without any thought-provoking, at least thought-provoking factors to have taken place. When they're around the cross, we're told in verse 45, now from the sixth hour at midday, there was darkness over land until the ninth hour, about, well, 3 p.m., and it was fascinating. The only one of the, well, the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the synoptics because they see it the same way or see the same thing from different angles. John has a unique uh, content. Many things that John says, the others don't. There's no one example is Gethsemane that we can um, read of very clearly, certainly, in the experience of the Lord, like Matthew, Mark, and Luke show us. But what Luke says about, about this, this darkness, now verse 45 says, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. You know, a fascinating thing that Luke says, chapter 23, I think it's verse, verse 45. Yes, well, 44 as well. It was now the sixth hour. There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. That's what Matthew's saying. But listen to this. While, while the sun's light failed. The word underneath that, and, and there's different translations, it's where we'd get the word eclipse from. And people have thought, this is a solar eclipse. This is the moon covering the sun. But it's not. It can't be. The time of year is one thing. But also that it lasted three hours. That it covered the whole land. And in fact, there's Amos. You see these references in the Bible with all of this kind of thing. When you maybe think, what is this? Can we understand what, what's refer, being referred to? I'm not saying this is a fulfillment, but it's an indication of something divinely imposed by way of judgment. 
This is Amos in the Old Testament 8 and verse 9. And on that day declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. And that's what he did. Sandstorms, clouds, eclipses. There is no explanation for this. Any more than there's a human explanation for the earthquake, the tearing of the, uh, the, the veil, the curtain in the temple from top to bottom, or the splitting of the tombs. All of these things are miraculous. They're signs. And so with all of them, you've got these religious people. And how would you feel? You know, you, you've, I don't know how you, you've maybe experienced that, that, that part, well, part of what we would experience of a solar eclipse, daytime, and that was years ago, wasn't it? And there was a lot going on, and it was on the news and everything. And, and I, there's almost an eeriness of, of that kind of darkness coming over. It's not a pitch blackness, but I don't know if you remember it happening. Uh, since we've been here, it, I remember it happening. And, and um, there it was. Amazing. A wonder, an astronomical wonder, and to, to be part of what's taking place and to see it. But this is completely different. And so if you had taken... This person who was claiming to be the Son of God, and you did everything with your associates, your contemporaries, to crucify and kill him, that you were doing everything possible. Remember, Pilate was warned by his wife not to touch, have it had anything to do with this innocent man. There's also the fact of some of the sayings that the people were making about Jesus, they terrified Pilate. And he went back in on one of the occasions, I think it's John that tells us, he went in and he said this to him. He said, who are you? These flashes of fear and uncertainty. And there they are, there's darkness covering, doesn't mean the earth, it's covering the land. Could be, I could translate it either way. But um, the Lord is showing in the darkness around the cross. The Father is showing and concealing from all view what's taking place. We have no way of accessing that. We can just think that it is emblematic and symbolic. Old Testament is full of the ideas of darkness being indicative of judgment. But there's the blackness of darkness forever that's referred to in the New Testament. The horrific thought of isolation from God forever. The blackness of darkness forever. He is the light of the world and when we come to discover and know and realize that light, any darkness we may go through in our Christian lives is, is horrific. But it's nothing by way of comparison with what he went through. And amazingly, as so often, you know, we can notice as, as he is about the ninth hour, so after three hours of darkness, it's our, when our Lord says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Darkness, silence. The Pharisees aren't wondering what on earth is happening. They're not stopping to think. This is the thing with signs and miracles and they're not going to convert anyone. God can use them. That's not to say that God, in, in, in any of our lives, God may have used whether something in our experience or someone, someone else's. He may have used that to bring us on. They're not saving though. Faith comes through hearing. And that, that's not the, the, what the church says. It's what, it's what God says in, in the Bible. He may use things, but it's ultimately the word. Ultimately, through hearing the word of God. But the miracles, he see them, the darkness. And when he's, he's crying out, his language, it's, some say, well, it's, it's the Aramaic and the Kun. I don't think it's that at all. Here, here is one who says, does he not, in, 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 in the Messianic Psalms, in Psalm 22, that his tongue is cleaving to his jaws. He's parched. He can't speak properly. He's so thirsty. And when he's saying, Eli, Eli, which is my God, L and I, the end means my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? That's as he's coming out of this. <coughs> Excuse me. He's emerging spiritually and experientially from what happened on the cross, where that darkness is itself symbolizing what's being uh, what's taking place. No one to th think too much if we're going to come back and look at these sayings of our Lord God willing. But this part is before us today where we think about the Pharisees, think about the religious people, and to think of ourselves. What are we looking for? The blackness and the darkness 
and, and his crying to God, asking, I mean, quoting Psalm 22, they, what do you think, do they know their Bibles, these, these teachers? He said to Nicodemus, are you the teacher? He was the leader, it would seem. He was, well, not principal, but you know, he's, he's the, the teacher of teachers. Are you the teacher of Israel, the Lord says, and you don't know these things? Well, there it is. They're hearing him crying to God. And they're saying he's asking for Elijah to come and help him. And they're rubbing their hands and they say, let's see. Others wanted to give him, realizing what was happening. You see the thing. They realized that he's parched. For 48 says they took a sponge filled with sour wine, put it in a reed, and gave it to drink. This isn't the same as the, the, the kind of um, sort of anesthetic that could be offered at the time of crucifixion. But a different thing. He refused that. Anything that could have had that. Um, numbing or, or dulling effect but here is different he cannot speak and they give him uh, what's, what's described there they give him the, the sour wine they put it on a reed and give it to him to drink he's not going to get much to drink from that is he but it's enough for him to say what he says we're told in verse 50 he cried again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit the thirst was quenched so that he could make <clears throat> that he could make that declaration and at the time of making the declaration he was yielding he amazing words yielded up his spirit he gave himself that that isn't you know some people would look at it and they'd, they'd think of even think of samson maybe it's a classic example of someone who whatever you the ins and outs of it he brought the building down on himself and on the Philistines. Avenging, God allowing him to avenge himself of his two eyes on the Philistines. Um, Samson brought his own death. It's a military context and there's, there's you know, ways to think about that. But even if it was the, the worst, where, where, for, for different reasons he were to end his own life. That still is not in any way what's happening here. Because we have no, we cannot, we cannot yield our spirit to God. We don't say, I'm ready now. We maybe feel it sometimes, if at all. You know what I mean by that? But when the time, when the time is, is there, he takes us. He receives us. I will come again. John 14, and will receive you unto myself. I will come. And Stephen, seeing in Acts 7, he sees, I think reading that the other day, it's so glorious how he, say, he, how he sees heaven opened from earth. He sees the glory of God. He sees Jesus standing there. And he's talking to Jesus. He's praying to him while everything else is, is happening and taking place. What does he say? But I'm going to leave the, the younger ones with this, if you're not sure. Afterwards, in Acts 7, I'm not putting extra things on parents or anyone saying this. Look at what Stephen says when um, he's passing away. And you'll see it's different from what the Lord is saying here. The Lord gives himself, Father, into your hands. I commit my spirit. I commit my spirit it's not Pilate it's not the Jews they didn't kill him John MacArthur's got an amazing book called the murder of Jesus and it's I think intended to highlight the human side of what happened where that's that's what it was by way of intention but we know it wasn't in term of fact because he said no man takes my life from me it cannot be a murder <coughs> Isaiah, 6, um, Isaiah, 4, Isaiah 53 highlights the fact that he voluntarily and willingly and knowingly, unlike the sheep before its shearers is dumb, he didn't open his mouth. And as the sheep is led to the slaughter, unwittingly and unaware, he went in full knowledge and increasing awareness as the cross approached. But you know, he yields up his spirit and the, the religious people are none the wiser, none the better. They don't have a clue what's going on. 
And they've got that. They'll have the Old Testament. They'll be studying it. They'll have all the, all the attire and they'll have all the positions in society and all the rest of it. But they're as lifeless. They're as spiritually dead. In a sense, they're worse than other people. Worse in the sense of being under a greater judgment. A greater judgment for having had the Bible and having had the Scriptures and having never made use of them properly. It would have been better for them. You know, this is what the Lord is saying. Not, he said it will be more tolerable for the cities of Sodom. It will be more tolerable for Sodom in the day of judgment than for like Capernaum. And, and uh, we says, woe unto you Bethsaida, woe unto you Chorazin, woe unto you Capernaum. You'll be exalted up to heaven, will you? He said, you will be brought down to hell. If the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. Now, that, that isn't hypothetical. You know, it's not because it's, it's not any human who's speaking. The Lord is saying that. The one who was down with Abraham, the one who announced the judgment, the one who was with Abraham at the announcement of Isaac, and then the three angels coming, one was the Son of God in angelic human form. The two went to Sodom and to the cities of the plain, and one stayed with Abraham. And we know who that was. The sign, the wonder, has no effect on these people. And the one who was there with Abraham, he said, if they had what you had, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But what we're trying to say, and forgotten it, and here it is, he says it will be more tolerable for Sodom in the day of judgment than for some people who have heard the gospel, I'm paraphrasing that last bit, who've heard the gospel and have never made the proper use of it. It would be better to have never heard it. It doesn't mean that people won't be judged. And the awful thing we maybe try and wrestle with is how can God judge someone who's never heard the gospel? Well, we say, how can God do anything? This is what Romans 10, 9, 10 highlights these not just questions but people with actual objections how dare god do this what we forget is our connection to adam that adam was our representative and we all sinned in him and fell with him in this first transgression it's made very clear in the bible romans especially un unfolds the, the chapter four and um, highlighting the connection that we, we have to adam first Corinthians 15 the first the, the first adam was of the earth. The last Adam is the man from heaven and so on. We have no appreciation of what sin and fallenness is if we think that all it is, and, and that is massive, but if we think all it is is that sin is a matter of thought, word, and action. Sin is, is part of our nature. Now, we, how do you understand what fallenness, what sin actually is? It's hard to analyze it. A scientist can never do it. But you know, you can know what it's all about. And not in the sense of knowing it for its own sake, but knowing it as a view to bringing you to the Lord. To see, and for me, to see our sins and not to be looking on and wanting signs and wonders and expecting this, that, or the next thing to happen. Because also that we told that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from, from top to bottom. That was a handbreadth wide. You're not going to tear that curtain. The Lord did. It was showing that the way into what was symbolized in the most holy place had now been fulfilled. We read in Hebrews that he has opened to us the new and the living way into the holiest of all. It's by the blood of Jesus. All that the priests, all the sacrifices, and all of these, these things symbolized. The Jews believed in. They thought God liked blood. They thought he liked sacrifice. And that's, you know, people... And, and, and a lot of things happening, ritual sacrifice, demonic. You think of, of the, there were some of the tragedies that, that Solomon brought to place, that brought to pass in the very place that God had set aside for his name, that Solomon had built a temple. Glorious days. And what's he doing when his heart's stolen and he goes away and goes off the rails for such a long time? He's even building satanic temples where children would be sacrificed in fire to appease this God. It's the devil. It's Satan. Anything 
anything but the real, the living, and the true God. Anything that appeals in any way to our fallenness. The tombs were opened. As an earth, as the earth shook, an earthquake took place, the rocks were split, and the tombs were opened. Just think about all of this. This is all happening. The Lord yields up his spirit. And we're told that the temple curtain is torn. We're told that there's an earthquake. We're told that through the earthquake the rocks were split. And we're told also that some of the tombs were opened. It's all symbolism. It's all indicative of the fact that God is there, that he is present. You can, in a sense, almost see, almost see creation convulsing. Some have spiritualized it and said, well, this is the earth trembling at what's happening to its maker and the sun hiding its face and causing darkness so it can't see. Well, the Bible doesn't say any of that. The statements of fact, the presence of God in the Bible, often in the Old Testament, leads to earthquakes. Sinai. Then at God's presence shook the earth in the wilderness. Then drops from heaven fell. There's also, in Acts 4, the church was praying for divine intervention. And we're told the place where they were praying was shaken. The place started shaking. The very, but imagine that happened just now. What would you do? What would I do? We'd, 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 be, in, we'd be in awe, wouldn't we? We'd realize what was happening. And, and, and we'd no doubt have the great, I mean, not that we look for the need or, the, or look for these things, but what we're trying to say is where God was pleased to do that it was all to show, largely, not exclusively, but to show his presence. I am with you. So the disciples are looking round. Had they had the eyes to see at the time, don't we think of that ourselves? They'd have realized that all these signs are round are underscoring the fact of who he is and what God is doing in creation. And the fact that the tombs of many saints were opened doesn't mean that they were lying there alive and waited for the three days until the resurrection, three days or so. But that the, the earth split. The tombs were opened and they rose, Matthew tells us, when he rose. Not that they rose before our Lord's resurrection. Not that they rose at the time of his birth. He is the first fruits of those who sleep, First Corinthians 15 says. Meaning that when he rises, he is the one in virtue of whose resurrection everyone else will rise to. He said, because I live, you will live also. I am the resurrection and the life. There's many other signs. We'll maybe get a, a time to look at another time, but just trying to see the contrast for how the Jews looked on and the, the religious people looked on and, and they weren't even happy thinking we've done it. See the corruption, or try not to, but you see the corruption, the religious corruption with backhanders and covering this and we'll get you out of trouble with. How on earth are they going to be able to say, you know, these, these soldiers, to, to say to Pilate, well, we fell asleep when we were on watch. Seriously. The religious people are in a panic. They're saying, we'll tell them this. We'll give you some hush money. You just keep quiet. And Corruption. In the, of the most horrific kind about the most important and the most essential of truths. They called him an imposter. And they said, he said to them, he'll rise in three days. But let's prevent that. Seal the tomb, Pilate said. And there's the guards. And you can be sure his disciples won't come. But no, an angel came. And the presence of the angel, did you notice when we read the young ones? The angel descended from heaven and there was an earthquake. An angel. Not only God, but an angel from heaven. Arriving on earth. Dazzling and glorious. And clearly of heavenly origin. Now you either play on words under it. Maybe English quite catches it. But the earth quaked. And the guards quaked. Similar word. The earth quaked was shaken. There was an earthquake when the angel came. And the men, the, the Roman soldiers looking on the tomb, they were like earthquakes. They, they, the tremors, not only that, they, they, they lost consciousness. When they became like dead men, were they standing still in shock? Or did they just pass out? They realized what happened and they were down on the ground. 
They couldn't get up. They became like dead men. John says in John Revelation 1, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Daniel knew what it was to be physically exhausted and faint through the revelations and through the presence of the Lord, physically not coping with it. But the women were able to. And the angel, and you see him sitting on the stone. John tells us there's two. As one speaks, doesn't matter. Not that there's different accounts. But the, the, the women are there and they, he says to them, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? I know you're looking for Jesus. He's not here. He's risen. And the, the, the story unfolds as an odd in such a glorious, a glorious almost tension when you read it because you know where, what's going to happen to them. And, and we really stop just now with one thing. And it's when the Lord meets them. He, he speaks to the women and they go. And when the Lord meets the disciples, I think uh, ESV says greetings. It, it is. I mean, the one word, it's, it, it's a word that does mean greetings. It's a well-wishing word. William Hendrickson, a renowned New Testament commentator, if you can access his works, they're very, very rewarding. He said it in the, co in the course of his commentary, before explaining, commenting on it, that what you could think of it in our terms is even in the morning, it's like the Lord saying to them, good morning. Think of that. The serenity, the calm. He's saying hello to them. He's saying greetings to them. Hendrickson said, you know, like it's in, the, in John 21 when on the resurrection following the resurrection um, when, the, when the appearances and Peter saying I'm going fishing and when the Lord says the, the, the old Bible says come and dine you might think that dine is a proper word to have in the Bible other translations will say come and have breakfast it's more real isn't it in the sense that it's like someone saying good morning to you it's like you, you know for him to say that there wasn't any show. There wasn't any noise. The world never saw him after his resurrection. But the church did. And it's possible that this was the gathering of 1 Corinthians 15 telling us of over 500 brethren at once. He is alive. And he's speaking to us. Let's remember these words. That all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. And that statement, not promise, I am with you always let's pray just now lord our god we thank you for this time i need your help constantly to understand and enter into the, the the meaning of your word and we pray that you will be your guide and our teacher not in the sense that it's an act all of its own to read or try to study your word but you have chosen and you have appointed your word as sam says you've magnified your word above all your name that it's there that you show yourself and it's there we can meet you. And that's what we seek and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing some verses from Psalm 96a. This is Sing Psalms. It's page 126. Uh, first four stanzas, verses 1 to 8. Psalm 96a will sing a new song to the Lord. Sing praises to his name and his salvation day by day in all the earth. Proclaim. It sing down to verse 8, shall we? Psalm 96, say, eh? Oh, sing a new song to the Lord. Oh, sing a new song to the Lord. Sing praises to his name. And his
Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.